I, I don't really believe that this story that I'm about to share with you is historically accurate because it, it really doesn't sound like Margaret Mead, the famous anthropologist. And it functions a little bit too conveniently as a preacher story. I mean, there's an entire <laughs> subgenre of literature that preachers turn to to be able to create a sermon illustration. And when I tried tracking this one back, the earliest uh, printed copy of this story was in a book co-authored by Philip Yancey, the famous uh, evangelical writer. So he claims that he heard the story from a physician who attended Margaret Mead's lecture, but, you know, he might claim a lot of things. Uh, but folks, things that are not historically accurate can still be true. Two things can be true at the same time, B uh, but apocryphal or historical I like it, so I'm going to share it with you. It's just a paragraph long. This is a, a version written by Gideon Lasco. According to a commonly shared story, the anthropologist Margaret Mead was supposedly asked by a student what she thought was the earliest sign of a civilized society. There are many variations of the antidote, but generally details are similar. To the student's surprise, Mead replied that the first sign of civilization is a healed human femur, the long bone that connects the hip to the knee. Mead explained, as the story goes, that wounded animals in the wild would be hunted and eaten before their broken bones could heal. Thus, a healed femur is a sign that a wounded person must have received help from others. Mead is said to have concluded helping someone else through difficulty is where civilization starts. Now, in truth, anthropologists are sort of like archaeological detectives. They're looking for early signs of humans in, in uh, baked pottery, in stone tools, uh, signs of collective living like the foundation of a wall that went around a village or a city or some early written language. This story seems a little bit too tender-hearted for Margaret Mead, but still, I, I think an anthropologist might see a healed femur as something to think about what kind of culture makes that possible and whether or not that's a, a legitimate sign of civilization. We evolved to instinctually care for our young, but just as we see in wolf packs and dog packs, and sociologically we have more in common with dog packs than we often do with chimpanzee or gorilla uh, packs, when a pup reaches the equivalent of a human adolescence, you know, being disrespectful and, and a nuisance, a pup's own mother will bite and growl to make it go away to what is probably the equivalent of wolf or canine college. But giving that kind of care to an injured adult, that begins to speak to a more sophisticated relationship than just a shared goal of species survival. And in fact, anthropologists will point to a tribe that is breaking down when they're not taking care of their wounded or their elderly, and they assume that their civilization is falling apart. After all, it's one thing to bring food back to the elderly and the injured when there's lots of food, but it's quite another thing to put your own existence at risk in order to take this very civilized extra measure. In Viktor Frankl's brilliant reflections on his time in a Nazi concentration camp, he talked about how Freud had predicted that under the right circumstances, everyone would resort to being a beast deprive people of basic food, water, shelter, sleep, um, safety. You deprived of, of, of that long enough, and the monstrous will emerge in virtually everyone. But Freud was theorizing about that. Frankel was living in it. He was living in that kind of deprivation, along with thousands of other Jews during the Holocaust. Frankel knew his wife and children were killed in the camp where they were taken. He had the manuscripts of his life's work and research taken from his hands and torn apart in front of him. He knew what it was to be hungry, 
to be cold and knowing that thousands of his peers were being marched into the gas ovens on the same grounds, killed day after day. But he said that though the deprivations in the camp did cause many people to become monsters, the same deprivations also revealed the angelic, the saintly, in those who would share their rations with a sick person or even give their shoes to someone suffering from frostbite, freezing in outdoor work. That's not a survival instinct. This is a choice to feel empathy, to be able to show compassion. Now, there are several overlapping terms and values here. We use compassion as a sign of civilization, or the lack of it as a sign of a breakdown in civilization. And if you've paid much attention to the history of my preaching, you know that I equate compassion with spirituality with lots of kudos given to Jesus Seminar founding scholars Marcus Borg and Karen Armstrong. The late Marcus Borg very succinctly boils down the mission of Jesus' ministry to being a teacher of radical compassion. If you've never read his early work, a book titled Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, I highly recommend it as a key to escaping the formal creedal religion and into understanding the real significance of the teaching of Jesus and not just the later church's teachings about Jesus. Karen Armstrong, almost certainly now the world's leading scholar in Western religions, started the Charter for Compassion trying to give spiritual people of all faith traditions a place in which they could find meaning and purpose in life. Again, I would encourage you to just Google the Charter for Compassion, listen to some of the YouTube videos, read some of the essays and articles she's published. If you try to read one of her books, uh, make a big pot of coffee and, and uh, get a well-lit, quiet place, it's intense and it's long. She's famous for 900-page books. But I don't think there's anyone alive today who can hold a candle to Armstrong's credibility as a religious scholar. And she sees compassion as being the key that ties Judaism, Christianity, and Islam together. That being said, I will not belabor the point further. I think over the history of my teaching, writing, and preaching, the entire canon of all the videos and, and podcasts that David Ketchum and I have up, that we've said enough that we can assume that compassion is central to spirituality, central to being civilized, and I would argue to being mentally healthy. Last week, I bemoaned the fact that fewer and fewer people really want to make the effort to be a genuinely good person. I cited the Zoroastrian tradition that is key to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, and teaches the threefold path to becoming spiritually enlightened, which are good thoughts, good words, and good deeds. One listener immediately wrote to challenge my use of the word good. How, he asked, do we determine what is good and what is not good? I don't really know this person's background, but I recognize the question. Because when you are trying to see if you can mentally get out of traditional religion, one of the things that you're having to give up, one of the things that classical Christianity or Judaism or Islam offers to you is absolute certainty about what is right and wrong. If you believe very specifically in traditional Judaism, Christianity, or Islam, then you possess a belief in a supernatural theistic God who is absolute the judge both of the whole world and of every single individual in it, and you have a religious text which you can hold up as being a reliable expression of truth by which you can confidently know right or wrong. Christians have the Bible, Jews have the Torah, and the Muslims have the Quran, even though they oftentimes contradict one another and contradict themselves, they 
reside or, or, or we allow them to hold on to a sense of authority so that we can know what is good. You may recall me having said in the past that progressives have to make a choice to give up false certainty and to accept an honest uncertainty that there are times we cannot know. And folks, there are truths that change. There are things that are true in one era that are not true in another. When you acknowledge that all religions, their supernatural theistic image of God and their very humanly created sacred text are ancient ideas, but they're not ancient facts, then you have to search for truth in more relative terms. I don't want to wander too far into philosophical word soup, but there is a field of philosophy that concerns itself with how we know what we know. Lots of philosophers wander into those conversations, but about this, the most famous and most familiar to us would be the work of Rene Descartes, most remembered for his famous cogito, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. That is, the fact that I'm aware of my own thinking makes it obvious that I must in some form exist. That simple interpretation is actually debatable, but not here and not right now. We're not going to debate it. There are three ways of knowing. We can know things from revealed truths, like scripture from God or hearing the voice of God. We can know things through reason, the way that you know what equal is, even though you've never seen two things that are really equal, not exactly, but you understand the concept through reason. And thirdly, we know things through experience. I understand that a hot stove can burn me due to the fact that I have had brief but memorable experiences with having touched a hot stove. Once we accept that revealed knowledge is entirely unreliable, then we are left with only two ways that we know anything, induction and deduction. Descartes' cogito is an example of deduction. I'm thinking, and even if I'm thinking that I might not exist, I am thinking, and the fact that I'm thinking means I must exist in some way. Or the example that we were given as freshmen in our first logic classes, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Unless, of course, you come to class with some clown uh, like Woody Allen, who also has a degree in philosophy, and he says, all men are mortal, Socrates were mortal, therefore all men are Socrates, which of course does not stand up to either deduction or induction. Induction has more to do with analysis. We see that 90% of the people in the world are right-handed, so if you point at any one person in the audience, you will assume that that person is right-handed, and you will be wrong 10% of the time. But don't be too worried if you have trouble remembering the difference between deduction and induction. The most famous fictional character who claimed to use logical deduction was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's creation, Sherlock Holmes, who often explains to the bewildered Dr. Watson that he reached his conclusion using deduction, but if you actually read the text, he was using induction. So if Sherlock Holmes couldn't get it right, Go easy on yourselves when you can't get it straight. The point that there is no revealed truth from God or Scripture, none, none from from horoscopes or psychics or crystal balls or tea leaves, we have no absolutes. We have through reason and observation the application of critical thinking. Reason. We have reasons to form an opinion or a belief, some with greater confidence and some with lesser confidence. So when we are asked, how do you know what is good? We are left to the inductive reasoning to make a choice. I'm tempted to reference the Supreme Court Justice Potter Stewart, who in the 1964 uh, Jacob Ellis in a versus Ohio case said, I can't define pornography but I know what it is when I see it. 
But unless you've been living in a cave for the past couple of months, you know that such subjective conclusions cannot be universally applied. For more than 500 years, Michelangelo's David has been lauded as one of the world's most outstanding pieces of art. But in Florida, two families have raised a legal stink about the statue being used in public school classrooms because they see it as being a pornographic nude. Now, that seems silly to almost all of us, especially to the city officials in Florence, Italy, where the statue has been on display for centuries. But truth about something like this can be very slippery. I hope I'm not going to burst your bubbles when I confess to you that when I was young, more than 50 years ago, National Geographic, sometimes even the underwear section of the Sears catalog, was potentially pornographic. Clearly, a lot of parents in Florida still have the perspective of a 12 or 13-year-old boy, but that's just something we've got to deal with. We have debates about what is good because the judgment of good depends upon the perspective of individuals. Many people whose livelihoods have derived from mining coal insist that using coal as an energy source is a good thing, while most of us who have to deal with the effects of pollution but whose personal wealth is not derived from burning coal see it as being universally a bad thing. When President Eisenhower appointed former GM President Charlie Wilson to be Secretary of Defense, in his congressional hearings to approve that appointment, some legislators were concerned that Wilson still owned millions of dollars worth of GM stock and that he might be biased towards GM in giving out military contracts. So Mr. Wilson boldly proclaimed to Congress that what is good for GM is good for the country. Mm -hmm. While it may have been evidently true that what was good for GM was really good for Mr. Wilson, <laughs> for the rest of us, we have repeatedly seen that what is good for the bottom line of the automobile industry is bad for people who breathe air, mm -hmm. or drink water, or eat agricultural products. To say what is good means that we have to make a judgment between individual good and corporate good, because what may be good for one person may cause harm to others. And so we are constantly in debate about individual rights and country, community, and sometimes global obligation. There's always a tension between individual and corporate good. We preserve private property so that the profit motive will inspire innovation, hard work, creativity, and productivity. But we cannot ignore the obvious social ills, such as poverty, crime, domestic violence, and instability caused by the hoarding of the world's goods by the wealthy. As I've previously noted, those of us who take a progressive view of spirituality almost always come down on compassion as a matter of first importance. I hope that we will stop mining and burning coal as a fuel source, but I also hope that we'll offer job training and alternative employment to those who become unemployed when we shut down coal mines. I'll cite once again the second century Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, who said, that which is not good for the beehive cannot be good for the bees. And so if burning coal hurts the hive, then an individual bee that owns a coal mine should stop making the decision to dig deeper and burn more. Still, one of the sermons that you'll probably never hear is one based on the Jesus saying that's found in both Matthew and Luke, where Jesus tells us to sell all we own and give the proceeds to the poor so that we will have treasures in heaven. It sounds compassionate, radically compassionate, but it's also clearly rather impractical. If you sell all you own, you will become one of the world's destitute in need of charity from others, which is why Jesus is rarely used as a resource in economics classes. What we're looking for here is a level of compassion that leads to the greatest good for the largest number of people. I don't foresee a time when we would be in danger of 
droves of people deciding to sell everything they own and give it away, thereby wrecking the global economy. But we are in danger of people tilting the balance between individual good and corporate good more and more every year, every single year, in the direction of individualism. Hoarding of all of the world's goods so that they can sock away in their own bank account every dime they can get their grubby little hands on is what is creating poverty, hunger, sickness, and wars. The United States now has the highest level of income inequality in the developed world. As the rich get a larger and larger piece of the pie in income, and that's without even looking at wealth inequality. It's, it's broadly known in the United States that just eight families have as much wealth as the bottom half of this nation of 300 million people. That eight families have the wealth of 150 million people. Having that kind of poverty in the richest nation in the world in the richest period in the history of the world, can only mean that our real poverty is in compassion. We simply don't feel the suffering of the poor. As Gandhi famously said, the world has enough for everyone's need, but not enough for everyone's greed. It is in coming to rec recognize the difference between need and greed that our real work of inductive and deductive reasoning is needed. And if you have to err on one side or the other, you can't really go far wrong by erring on the side of greater empathy and more compassion. Why has our world become so heartless? Why? Why is there such a shortage of compassion how have we tolerated an economic system that makes some people fabulously wealthy while leaving so many in poverty? I think that at least a huge portion of the problem is the scale of civilization. There are 8 billion people in the world. Industrialization has caused a massive population shift from rural agricultural areas to large cities. As nations become more industrial, Actual ownership of manufacturing becomes more and more distant from the front lines where real people are doing the real manufacturing. In the late 19th century, Andrew Carnegie became one of the most wealthy people in the world through the steel industry. This little city where we live and the little town where I grew up in rural Kentucky and thousands of other cities and towns were given libraries by Andrew Carnegie who became one of the most lauded philanthropists of all time. But he made that money through the cruel exploitation of his employees in the steel factories, where he was anything but philanthropic mm -hmm. and where he virtually never showed up. He didn't know the people. He didn't see how they lived. It isn't that he invented cruel exploitation of employees, but he raised it to a level that had never been seen before. He owned the steel mills, but he didn't work there. He didn't know the people who were making him rich. The more distant we are from the suffering that we cause, the harder it is for us to feel compassion for them. The stock market now insulates us from knowing, I don't know what all my pension fund is invested in. I don't know where the check that goes into my bank account once a month I don't know really where that comes from. When a cheese company can own a cigarette company and a clothing brand or a coffee company can directly or indirectly use slave labor as the foundation of their production, but do it in a way where we never see it, then it's easy to live blissfully unaware of the suffering that lies behind the two dozen pairs of shoes that every one of us has in our closets. If the early human with a broken femur had lived alone on my street, he might have died from starvation lying on the floor of his kitchen before anyone realized that he was injured. It isn't that there are 
not cruel and greedy people in every kind of civilization, but I want to believe that most people are inclined to be good. Most people, when confronted with a crisis, can feel empathy, at least at a base level. But compassion needs almost an imminent opportunity to be exercised. In our world of 8 billion people, 15% of us are obese, but 1% among us is literally starving to death. Now, if we were living on a tiny island with just 100 people on it, we wouldn't tolerate 15 people becoming obese while a child in the village starved. We wouldn't tolerate someone having three houses while 10 people had no shelter at all. It's only because of the distance we put between ourselves and others that allows for greedy and, and self-indulgence at one end of the spectrum to reign and chronic suffering at the other. I think the major reason for religion to exist in the 21st century is the creation of compassionate communities. Now, this happens in two ways. One is moral instruction given in spiritual communities, instruction that heightens our awareness of compassion, and, and, and then the actual physical gathering of people. When you put people in the same room, that gives them the opportunity and awareness of where compassion is the most needed. But need and the willingness to meet that need is not a one-way street because a life lived in compassion becomes its own reward. Many of you know that for the past several years, I've been increasingly involved in the care of an older member of our church who had no family members, no children, no siblings, and no one close enough to be involved in her life when she really needed help. A few years ago, we all began to notice that Pat would sometimes get lost on the way to a church lunch outing or even at places where she had regularly been in the past. Little by little, I and others began to pay attention to her lapses of memory and cognitive decline. But when the pandemic arrived, I started to pay particular attention to her needs to protect her from exposure to a pandemic that I feared might kill her. Over time, she decided to make me her executor and gave me power of attorney to help make both medical and business decisions to protect her and her assets as she got older. Eventually, she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, and though many other church members were involved in Pat's care, she became a daily concern of mine to the point where I realized that I was eventually going to have to either move into her home to directly help her or place her in residential care. Alzheimer's, folks, is a one-way ticket. It gets worse at different rates, but it always gets worse. A month ago, however, her slow decline came to an end when she suddenly and very unexpectedly died. In the sudden shock of her death, many people started saying to me, she was so lucky to have you in her life and things like, she loved you like a son, and even, where would Pat have been without you? But what I kept hearing in my own head was an unspoken response that I would now like to say out loud. I was lucky to have her in my life. I loved her like a mother, a friend, a companion, who was happy to go anywhere I was going, whether that was to get a haircut or out to a hole-in-the-wall bar to hear a blues band. And now that she's gone, I'm wondering what will become of me without her loving daily friendship. My relationship started out as a kind of pastoral obligation. I'll be honest with you. My time was given to her as a gift. But the exchange doesn't stay at that level. Compassion is not something that is given by the fit and, and well fixed to those who have a broken femur or no food. The man who survived the broken femur was not the only one who experienced civilization by being cared for by a healthy member of the tribe. The person who brought food to the wounded man for weeks was also changed. 
and speaking existentially, I can say that he or she was probably changed in very profound ways. There's nothing like that on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or Snapchat. And I will add as a parting thought, please do not rely on a weekly YouTube video or podcast to become your faith community. I hope you find inspiration and encouragement here, but this is not community. Community takes effort. You have to get out of the house at a set time. Go into a room where there will probably be someone you don't even like. And even the ones you do like will require a degree of tolerance and frequent servings of forgiveness. Don't be fooled. Every day with Pat was not a bowl of cherries. And she would regularly remind me that I wasn't necessarily easy to get along with either. Compassion is not only shown to the deserving. Sometimes it's given to the difficult, the demanding, the ungrateful. And now I realize that I even miss that. You cannot love 8 billion people. You will probably continue to eat fruit grown in slave labor conditions and wear shoes sewn together by children even when you try not to. But find your own tribe. Narrow it down to 20 or 30 people and be aware of their lives, their needs, their strengths, and their weaknesses. Be as ready to show compassion as you are to receive it, to listen to someone as much as you want to be heard, to give people a second chance as much as you believe that you deserve a second chance. It may not make you a saint, but it will at least make us appear to be more civilized. Thank you for watching our videos. We are entirely dependent on the donations of our listeners and members. We hope that you find this content to be important enough to help us to keep offering these videos to the public at no charge by becoming a regular contributor. Please click on the donate button on our website at www.spfccc.org. Thank you for your support of progressive religious programming.